Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is behind the camera, inside the monarch's milkweed kingdom. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Charlie Reinertson. Charlie, thank you so much for being here today and for bringing us one of my favorite topics and trips that I've ever been on. I can't wait to join you in Mexico for the next hour. Let's let's go ahead and dive in. Thank you, Sunny, and welcome everyone. I'm really excited to be with you uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'm calling in from Adirondack Park in Saranac Lake, and this is the summering grounds of the monarch butterfly. So today's presentation, just to give you a sense of what we'll cover, uh, I'll introduce myself, talk about my path to photography and guiding with natural habitat adventures, and then we'll meet uh, the monarch butterfly and friends. This is kind of the extended talk uh, today going beyond just uh, the wintering grounds of the monarch butterfly, and we'll take a look at their summer homes and what they're relying on uh, in the North Country and beyond. And then uh, we'll wrap up with an itinerary overview of Natural Habitat Adventures Kingdom of the Monarchs trip, uh, which I guided most recently in February and March. So just to dive right in, uh, I really fell for photography while I was a research biologist and I was studying the smooth and spiny softshell turtles in their uh, home in the Mississippi watershed. And I was documenting everything that I was uh, capturing both from a research perspective and also with my camera. And uh, so that was really what launched my photography career uh, is studying these particular turtles. And in uh, this research that I was working on actually helped to uh, recommend uh, areas that should be conserved to help this particular species of softshell turtle, the smooth softshell turtle. So the Minnesota DNR was concerned about its population and so they had us take a look at the genetic diversity of this species as it compares to the spiny softshell turtle. We were able to actually point to the genetic data and say that the smooth softshell turtle had significantly less genetic diversity than the spiny softshell turtle and that the DNR should do things, put, put actions in place to be able to protect their nesting habitat. So that, that really launched my interest in cataloging creatures. And through that research, I met this cast of characters, uh, all of these different turtles and frogs and insects that I was trying to capture uh, through photography. And as I was sharing my research, I started to get really excited about science communications. And so I started covering uh, various different species, including the sawwet owl uh, that you see here. And that launched a career in, in writing photography and videography. And I've worked for a lot of different uh, magazines and organizations, uh, most recently for the Wild Center uh, up in the Adirondacks. That's what originally brought me to this area. And now this exhibit is open. It's on climate change solutions at, at the Wild Center. And it's a 3,000 square foot space uh, that I, I was the project manager on this uh, team of people who put this together. Uh, and it's a really exciting exhibit that uh, really uh, amplifies voices and, and people working on climate solutions in the Adirondacks. So uh, right now I'm, I've launched my own business, Two Line Studio, and uh, I've been doing photography all around the world. Uh, and it's brought me to incredible places and I've been able to meet incredible people. And uh, one of those pieces of what I do through my business is uh, actually guiding with natural habitat adventures. So these are just a few of the moments that I've captured over the years um, and a quick look at my website. And that launches us into exploring the milkweed kingdom. So what I'd love to do is take this moment to share a video from my backyard. Uh, this uh, has been filmed over the last couple weeks. And just to give you a sense of the milkweed habitat and the creatures that call it home. And so often, uh, you know, we're talking about the monarch butterfly because it has this incredible migration that we'll get into. It has all these quirky 
um, things about it that make it a really fascinating insect to uh, pay attention to. Uh, but today's presentation, I want to kind of highlight a few of the creatures that also call this place home. So right now you should see the video going. This is in my backyard, this big patch of milkweed. And uh, over the years, this area has just expanded and expanded as we've allowed our uh, what was previously just grassy areas to transition to, into a prairie habitat. And so when you walk out in the backyard and you're looking closely at the leaves, you're just meeting all of these incredible insects not just monarch butterflies, but what you have here, a dogbane beetle, various species of grasshoppers, and all of these insects rely heavily on this habitat. And this habitat is really threatened because we've been, um, because of agricultural use and because of, of lawns. And so there's been a huge movement uh, to be able to bring these milkweed kingdoms back uh, so that these insects can thrive. And a lot of people are starting to uh, reduce the amount that they're mowing and allow a lot of these species to flourish. All right, here's a swallowtail feeding on uh, milkweed flowers from just a few weeks ago. And here we're starting to get into the monarch butterfly. So that was an egg that we were just looking at. And now uh, this is probably uh, the second stage of growth of the caterpillar, monarch butterfly caterpillar. And this is all just taken right out in the backyard. My first trip guiding with Natural Habitat Adventures on the Monarch Kingdom trip was this year. And so it's just been this unbelievable thing to look at my backyard with new eyes. Obviously, I've seen all these videos of the monarch migration and trying to learn more about it, um, but it it really didn't hit home until really traveling down there and getting to see what these incredible insects are doing. So this is just a little context for the uh, backyard area and and where those uh, where those insects are living and heading back down into the backyard here. And it's possible that this video is a little bit uh, stuttered. So let me just uh, share, stop sharing. Let me share my screen again and get back on here. Main screen. So I'd love to talk about monarch ecology and I show that initial video uh, as a way to say that we spend a lot of time reading about, learning about seeing this very dramatic monarch butterfly. Uh, but we don't spend a ton of time thinking about all the other insects that live in that milkweed kingdom that we just saw in that video. And uh, so we'll come back to this at the end of the presentation, but what I really wanted to think about here is we'll dive into the monarch butterfly. We'll talk about this incredible journey down to uh, Mexico and to Michoacan, um, but then we're going to come back to this idea that you know, this poster child of a species has really helped us conserve this habitat of milkweed um, and prairie uh, that all of these insects rely upon. So, but for now, we're going to go ahead and dive into what makes the monarch butterfly uh, such an incredible image and something that everyone has gravitated towards as the hero of the pollinators. So just going back a little bit, taking a look at the distribution and evolution of this species. So monarch butterflies evolved in the tropics and they depend exclusively on milkweed while they're in their larval stage. Here in the orange areas on this map, you're getting a sense of where monarch butterflies exist, but the monarch butterfly only migrates in North America. There's a small migration that happens west of the Rocky Mountains in California. And then the big migration happens east of the Rocky Mountains, everywhere all the way up to Canada, the Eastern seaboard, and all of the butterflies in that wedge migrate down to one very specific place in Mexico. And so uh, there are a few theories about why the monarch butterfly migrates. One of them is that milkweed is incredibly abundant uh, in the Northern North America continent. And so from Canada down the Eastern seaboard, east of the Rockies, that whole area, there's so much milkweed 
And so monarch butterflies have evolved to be able to take advantage of that to start migrating up into that area during the grows, growing season. But then as it starts to get cold, monarch butterflies cannot survive. And uh, this is an interesting point because monarch butterflies, again, they evolved in the tropics, looking at this map, really central along that equator, equator line. Um, but they're cold intolerant. Other butterflies have the ability to overwinter. Monarch butterflies cannot handle cold, cold temperatures for extended periods of time. The other theory that's driving why these butterflies are migrating in North America is to avoid parasites. So the idea is that if they stayed in the tropics and just exploded in population, that the parasites would, their life cycle would be really easy to just, you know, really take over. And so by uh, having generations leapfrog uh, north, and we'll talk about how that works, it kind of leaves the parasites in the dust. So let's jump into the life cycle before we get back to how they migrate. So monarch butterflies are dependent on milkweed from egg until they emerge from their chrysalis. And so uh, an adult female butterfly is flying around searching for the perfect place to lay her eggs. And on this slide, you're starting to see the size of an egg. So they're absolutely tiny. And the way you can differentiate this from like a spider uh, egg sac is by looking really closely, you can actually see these ridges. You can get something called a jeweler's loop, which is very inexpensive. And you're just able to look really closely at the egg to identify it if you're interested in doing this in your own garden. And so this uh, picture here, um, that I, these pictures in this uh, life cycle, I did not take. Um, and so this is by Jay, but uh, it just gives you a sense of how tiny that egg is. And the first job of the caterpillar, once it hatches, is to actually eat that egg. Because while monarch butterflies are fully dependent on milkweed, uh, it's also a very toxic food source. Milkweed has what is called a cardiac glycoside, which effectively um, acts on the sodium potassium pump. And all that you need to know is it's bad for your circulatory system and your heart and uh, can, uh, uh, it can be lethal even for the monarch butterflies who have evolved to be able to handle that toxin. So here you're seeing that uh, first stage larva um, feeding on its egg. And then after that, they turn their attention to feeding on the monarch leaf. And when they do this, it's incredibly dangerous. Uh, and part of that is because not only is this plant toxic with those cardiac glycosides, but milkweeds also produce latex, which is just really gooey um, substance that they exude when there's damage to the leaf or to the stalk. And uh, so the caterpillar itself has to very carefully make an incision in the leaf, allow some of that uh, latex to uh, drain, and then they'll actually eat the section of the leaf that has been drained of its latex. So they have a lot of strategies. Uh, the other thing that they have to do is some milkweed species have uh, a lot of hairs on the leaf. It's called pubescence. And they actually need to mow those hairs down before they can even get to that leaf structure. So most caterpillars die because they're trying to eat this food source but it's also the only thing that they can feed on. And part of the reason why they've evolved to have this really close relationship with milkweed is that it imparts uh, a defense for them. So as they're eating this milkweed that's very toxic, they're sequestering it in their tissues, and then predators that try to eat them or that eat them get sick. And so there's all kinds of studies of looking at birds and what happens to them when they try to eat caterpillars. And it's a gag reflex at, on the light end and, and much more sick on the heavy end. And so they've gotten these color, the coloration of both the caterpillar and the butterfly is really bright. And that's a warning coloration to be able to tell predators, I'm toxic, don't eat me. So on this left-hand side picture, you're actually seeing all of the instars, which are the different stages of growth. And so after each instar, the caterpillar actually sheds its exoskeleton and then enters a new growth phase. So once it's gone through those five instars, it starts to form what is called the chrysalis. And that 
is the form in which the caterpillar itself will uh, transform into a butterfly. And there's all kinds of research going into this uh, about how they do this, but essentially their cells kind of go into this goopy uh, soup and then just reorient into a new form. And it's absolutely fascinating. That's the Cliff Notes version that's a little bit diluted, um, but eventually they form this chrysalis and there's been a lot of, every aspect of the monarch butter, butterfly has been studied extensively and there's still areas to study. But one area for study is taking a look at why is there this beautiful golden sheen both on the line and then these dots. And the the idea is that it's actually camouflage, that it can make, the, make it look like water droplets on a leaf and it helps them blend into their surroundings. So here's a full look at going from egg all the way to chrysalis to adult. And one thing to note here, uh, is that this whole cycle typically in the in the summer takes about a month month and a half to, and it's temperature dependent so if it's colder it takes longer if it's warmer it, it's a shorter period of time and uh, what's fascinating is that when butterflies get into late august early september they are actually able to go into a different life form and that is the key to being able to migrate. So let's take a look at that. S let's start in Mexico. In Mexico over the winter, in about November, monarch butterflies arrive to the area. And they arrive to an area that's smaller than the size of Manhattan in the OML high elevation fir forest and they spend the entire winter there and then starting in march or april they start to fly north and they form what is called generation one so this blue uh, triangle here in this graph is indicating where the butterflies who have lived the whole winter in mexico have laid their eggs and that generation one blue triangle they then those eggs hatch the butterflies emerge and they fly north again into this green section of generations two and three and that's happening about in june so right now we're sitting in july august and that's generations three and four in the midwest and in, in the eastern seaboard and then in generation four and five you've made it all the way to parts of canada and maine and and that's going into september and at that point a lot of things happen so this is just another graphic taking a look at that um, it's noting that there is another migration that's happening west of the rocky mountains and uh, and it shows that uh, overwintering ground on the right hand side and this is courtesy of monarch watch which is an incredible organization if you have any questions after this presentation they're definitely worth checking out so what's happening? We've just to recap, we've made it all the way. It's it's about August or September, and we've through five generations of monarch butterflies made it uh, to the far far north, and now they're going to shift into another body type. And so they actually detect the season seasonal shift in a few ways. One, it's cold, and they recognize that. Number two, this is a big one, is the amount of light has been going down. Uh, and so they are actually observing that and taking note of that. And when it hits a certain amount of light per day, that also helps trigger them to go to this other life form. And finally, monarch butterflies are incredible at uh, detecting the chemical makeup of the plants that they eat and feed on. So the, when we looked at where does the mother lay her egg on, on the milkweed plant, she's actually landing on the plant, scratching the surface of the leaf, tasting the chemicals, and deciding whether that particular plant has the right chemical makeup for her offspring to be laid on that leaf. And so they use that same ability to detect chemicals uh, to be able to tell when the plants are starting to die back. And so that also triggers them to enter into this different body type. And this different body type 
uh, is called reproductive diapause. They essentially shut down all of their reproductive organs, they increase their fat storage, and they increase their lifespan, uh, reaching uh, a life as old as seven months in their adult form. Now, if you remember, from egg to adult in a regular life cycle, it's about a month to a month and a half. So they've extended their lifespan up to seven, eight times to be able to make this migration. And they do this migration uh, in August or September, and they make it all the way from, they funnel down uh, kind of in a cascade as they're recognizing those seasonal changes to one tiny, tiny place in Mexico. How they do this is still being extensively studied. So one of them is through a circadian clock, similar to what we have, where we're actually take, we're subconsciously aware of how much daylight is happening in the day, and that's changing some of the hormones that are released in humans. Similarly, monarch butterflies have that as well, and they also have an internal compass. And so they are, and in addition to that internal compass, there's new research that's suggesting that they're able to detect magnetic fields. Uh, and they actually have these two packets of magnetite on their abdomen, and it's believed that they're using that concentration of magnetite to be able to hone in on their final location as they approach this very, very tiny place. Uh, in the Oumel fir forest. So they're able to tell what direction they're going, they're able to tell the time of day, and then the magnetic field helps them navigate as well. And they're headed down to this very specific place that in the transvolcanic mountain range in the Oumel fir forest, and it's at about 10,000 feet. This migration was not discovered until roughly the 1970s. Uh, when researchers were in this area, and you might remember uh, when this National Geographic issue was published, uh, how they discovered it. So they've actually been using these tags that are placed on the wings of butterflies. And uh, so if someone finds an adult butterfly, they carefully put this identifying number on that butterfly. And if someone else finds a butterfly with a tag on it, they record that number and they put it into the database. Initially, that database, rather than being online, was by sending a letter uh, with the tag to researchers. And those researchers were collecting information about where these butterflies were going because these researchers noticed that monarch butterflies completely disappear in the fall, whereas their uh, counterparts, moths and other types of butterflies are overwintering in the location. Uh, these ones were just completely gone from the environment in the winter. And so this was a huge discovery. And here we're starting to take a look at the yellow outline of kind of what's called the buffer zone, which is where monarch butterflies could potentially be. And then all the butterfly icons are specific reserves. Uh, where monarch butterflies hibernate. So just taking a closer look, and now we're getting into pictures that I took this at the end of February, early March um, at the Oyamel fir forest. So this is what it feels like to be looking out into this area. Oyamel fir trees are very large diameter trees when they're old growth and they actually help regulate the temperature overnight because they kind of have that hot water bottle effect where they hold on to the warm temperatures of the day for longer periods of time, and that helps the butterflies maintain the right temperature. They're very, very susceptible to incredibly cold temperatures, and they actually don't like to be hot either. So they're migrating to this very specific place because it has a, a perfect climate for them to be able to overwinter. They also have access to food and water uh, through flowering plant plants that continue to uh, flower throughout the winter. And in this picture, you can actually see butterflies flying up in the sky here. So when you're visiting this area, the activity levels of what the butterflies are doing is entirely driven by temperature. So as the sun comes up and it starts to hit the trees, in the morning, the trees are completely covered in butterflies. Right here, you can see the branches literally bowing down with the weight of thousands of butterflies. And uh, 
to put that in perspective, each butterfly is half a gram. So to be able to pull this branch down, you're looking at about 80 pounds of butterflies. So you can do the math on that one. So if you're visiting the reserves on a cloudy or cool day, uh, you see the trees just laden with butterflies, both on the trunks and out in the canopy. And it looks a, a bit like this. And then as the sun starts to hit those clumps of butterflies, they start to fly. And it literally, talking with uh, travelers that I've been with, it literally feels like you're in a snow globe of butterflies and they're flying around, they're getting nectar, they're drinking water, and they're just, uh, you can literally hear their wing, the wing beats above you. Now in their home territory in the winter, in their overwintering grounds, there are predators of the monarch butterfly. And these predators, you can see this notch out of the butterfly's wing right here. Uh, there are a couple bird species and also a mouse that are able to process those toxins and feed on this incredible food source uh, during the winter months. Now, remember that the monarch butterflies arrive in Mexico roughly in November, and they their arrival is largely coinciding with the Day of the Dead, and it's uh, believed in Aztec culture that uh, the return of the monarch butterflies is the return of the souls of the dead. And uh, so they arrive in November to Mexico in the numbers of roughly 250 million today. Historically, we were looking at numbers of as many as a billion butterflies is an estimate that's been put out. Um, and then as you move through the winter, when you get to about March, uh, the butterflies start to mate and start to think about that northward migration. So this very butterfly that came up from this orange zone in generation four or five, which should be the generation that's happening at the end of this month and early September, those butterflies are going to start flying south and um, eventually make it to Mexico in November. And those same butterflies are gonna live all the way until March, they'll mate. And then the uh, especially the female butterflies are gonna fly north and lay eggs within this uh, swath of generation one that's in blue. So before we look at the itinerary of what it's like to be there, I'd love to share just a quick video um, from, uh, from this February, March. Let me just get that pulled up here. I'll just take a moment. All right, so just going to play this without sound uh, so that the streaming is a bit better. Here you're seeing the day start to warm up. The sun's been hitting those butterflies getting them ready to fly so that they have enough energy to fly. They're ectotherms, so they're getting their warmth from the environment. Here it's starting to warm up quite a bit, uh, probably middle of the day, and we're starting to see more flight. When it really warms up and you really get a lot of sunshine on those clumps, you literally have what's called a river or cascade of butterflies just streaming off the branches. Now that given that this is my first season guiding, I, this it's just an unbelievable experience that I, if you have the opportunity, it's absolutely amazing. Here's a, a sense of kind of the trails that you're walking on as you go. So just gonna get reoriented here and share my other screen. Okay, so we'll take a look at 
how you can actually explore the kingdom of the monarchs and see some of those scenes that you just saw in some of the photos. And then we'll wrap up with a quick conversation about the conservation of not only monarch butterflies, but all the species that rely on the same habitat as those incredible species. So this is just a quick overview of the location of where this trip goes. You fly into Mexico City and then you travel out to Angungueo. It takes about four hours to make that trek. And then you have your first day. And then eventually we see Valle de Bravo and you make your way back to Mexico City. So day one, uh, the journey is to be able to get to El Rosario Butterfly Reserve. And the way that we get there is by initially by a large tour bus that takes us from Mexico City to Angangueo. And from there, we pick up these covered pickup trucks. And those covered pickup trucks bring us up in elevation about 200 feet or a little bit more. And there we pick up a, a horseback ride uh, to make our way even higher up into the, the mountains. And at this point, Angangueo is roughly at about 90, 9,500 feet. And, and by the time we're seeing the butterflies, we're getting up to 10,000 or maybe 10,500 feet. And so this picture is showing you uh, the final stage. You're actually seeing folks that are, that are hiking uh, to be able to get to where the butterflies are. Each year and even throughout the season, butterflies are moving within this uh, ecosystem. So they might like a patch of woods uh, early season and then eventually move to another location. And these butterfly reserves um, are owned and managed by groups of people uh, uh, who are actually moving those trails throughout the season to be able to access the butterflies. And so they're not always uh, very level. This picture is showing a pretty nice wide open level marked trail uh, to be able to make it out to an area that you might be able to view the butterflies and these areas are um, a bit removed from the dense 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 areas where you would see the butterflies and uh, this you would have some quiet time here because uh, we're doing as much as we can to reduce our impact on uh, the species and so as you get really close uh, it's, it's a silent or very very quiet area to be able to experience being uh, with these butterflies that evening we stay in Angangueo, and the next day we head to another area, uh, Butterfly Biosphere Reserve uh, called Sierra Chinqua. And here we also take a horseback ride and then eventually hike uh, to be able to get out. And uh, we get to have a wonderful lunch at uh, the Butterfly Sierra Chinqua Reserve. Um, and then explore Angangueo, which is a really wonderful town that has its origin, origins in mining and ultimately uh, started to shift over to ecotourism and has all kinds of love and support for the butterfly migration. And day three, we head back to El Rosario uh, to be able to experience that again. Uh, and part of having three days in the itinerary for visiting the reserves is to give you a better chance to be able to see something like this. And so some days it is cold and cold being something like 40 or 50 degrees. And some days like this, it's warm, 60 or 70 degrees, maybe even 80. And you see much more butterfly activity. And uh, as far as flying goes, you'll always see the butterflies, be able to get to see them in their clumps. But as it warms up, you start to see more and more flying. As we leave the Butterfly Biosphere Reserve area, we head to Valle de Bravo, which is a really beautiful area and explore waterfalls and do some hikes. And on our way back to Mexico City, we stop in Toluca for this incredible art installation of, of stained glass and talk about some of the art and culture in that, in that region. And day five, uh, we get back to Mexico City where you can extend your own adventure afterwards or return home. So something that I like just about this itinerary in general is that it's pretty um, uh, tight. Like it's, it's, we get three days in the Butterfly Biosphere Reserve, but it's not one of the longer itineraries with natural habitat adventures. So you can kind of uh, bite it off a little bit more easily. Something that makes this particularly uh, special is the partnership with World Wildlife Fund. And on this trip in particular, 
uh, it's so visible to be able to see the work that World Wildlife Fund is doing uh, to be able to help conserve these butterflies. So let's jump into the conservation status. So if you look at the population trend as a whole, it is a, uh, a startling picture. This map is a little bit more jarring because what it's actually looking at is the total acreage that butterflies are occupying. As you can imagine, it's a huge challenge to estimate the number of butterflies in a clump of you know, butterflies on a branch of a tree and then to extrapolate the whole forest. And so what they end up looking at is how much of the forest the butterflies are occupying over time. Now, we see a population crash here around 2011, 12, 13, 14. And this was an incredibly hard winter where the it actually got cold enough for a lot of the butterflies in their uh, winter range to die off. And interestingly, that was a moment where we learned a ton about uh, monarch butterflies because we were able to count how many butterflies were on the ground uh, dead and it actually helped us refine our ability to estimate how many butterflies are actually in a given area of a forest. And we had vastly underestimated the number of butterflies uh, in those in the wintering grounds. And so right now, essentially the, the idea is that about 250 million individuals is a healthy population to look at, depending on who you talk to. Uh, but at the moment, monarch butterfly is on the endangered species list. And in particular, the, the, the word that's very important there is migratory. And so this phenomena of monarch butterflies migrating all the way down to Mexico, spending the winter and then using North America as their milkweed kingdom, um, that particular phenom phenomena is being uh, looked at as, as being in danger. Um, and so how did we get here? Uh, there has been a history of, of logging in, in the OML fir forest area. And this is actually a huge area of conservation success. So if this is a graph looking at the amount of uh, degradation happening because of logging, and uh, you're seeing that forest, the logging is just drastically dropping off starting in about 2008 or 2010. And uh, so it's reduced to levels that are very, very low at this point in time. Um, and right now the big concern is just illegal harvesting. So in the past there might've been harvesting that was for forestry purposes. And now the areas are conserved for the butterflies and that's a huge shift in the Mexican government and the folks that own these places, uh, the ejidatarios, which is the community of people that owns these areas. Um, ejido is the name for the collective ownership of a given area. And so when we were talking about Sierra Chinqua and El Rosario, those are two different ejidos owned by ejidatarios. Um, and we're starting to look at some of the incredible success. So we're seeing uh, huge efforts being put into uh, reforesting uh, these areas. So you'll see world wildlife signs down there who have been partnering with locals to be able to raise trees, nurse them to help and then uh, plant them. And then there's also a lot of sustainable agriculture happening to be able to uh, make up the loss uh, for these communities that uh, forestry would have provided. So now the big threat that we're looking at is in the soybean and corn belt uh, area. So we've done a ton of work uh, and, and Mexico has done a ton of work to conserve those areas and to reduce logging. But when we look further north, uh, we are starting to see that uh, huge agricultural operations are a major problem for monarch butterflies as well as other insects. So uh, this graph, uh, is just showing uh, the use of uh, glypho glyphosate. Uh, and that is a chemical that's a uh, uh, herbicide and a pesticide. Herbicides and pesticides are essentially what are causing the downfall of, of monarch butterflies in most of North America. And so by uh, designating um, I-35 as the monarch highway, which is the highway that goes north-south, uh, basically follows the monarch migration. 
Um, and by doing a lot of different conservation efforts and re restoration efforts, uh, we're starting to bring back that monarch population and ensure that they have food sources to rely on throughout their habitat. So this is just a few of the ways to get involved. Um, you can plant native milkweed at home. You can provide nectar plants uh, for adult butterflies to feed on, because remember, they're exclusively dependent on milkweed from egg until chrysalis. And then after they hatch as adults or they emerge as adults, then they're feeding on nectar plants and um, as they live out their adult life. The other thing that you can do is limiting mowing. Uh, since my wife and I moved into our house, uh, we have stopped mowing huge areas uh, in the backyard, and we've seen milkweed, our, the various milkweed gardens that are back there just explode over time. And so going back to that initial video that we watched together that I filmed in the backyard, um, you know, those places are just becoming these, these monarch havens and havens for other insects. And so that's just a huge opportunity for us to be able to rewild our yards. The other thing we can do is support beneficial farming practices that avoid the use of herbicides and pesticides, or at least the rampant use of those. And we can also support monarch habitat conservation. So uh, if you're interested in seeing more of my photography uh, that I've featured throughout uh, this presentation, you can go to my gallery at gallery.twoline.com. And the monarch migration photos will be uh, coming soon in the next month. I'll publish those. And so this is the website, twoline.com, and head to the gallery. And you'll find uh, my work in Yellowstone National Park, Grand Teton, and all throughout the world uh, in this area. So I'd love to take this time to answer questions. Uh, I kind of, I covered a lot of ground. <laughs> Um, so I'm sure there are a lot of questions out there and, uh, uh, you know, I'd encourage you to stay in touch and, and follow me on Instagram and, uh, you know, shoot me a note if you liked this presentation. Uh, so thank you so much for your time and, and I'd love to hear, hear your questions for the remainder of the time. Charlie, thank you so much. Uh, it was a fabulous presentation. Before we start the Q&A, I want to remind everyone that they can submit their questions via the questions field in the control panel. Let's see. Um, but we also have quite a few questions. Um, Not one of our any viewers, questions. Oh no, I got, I got them for you. I'm, I, one of our viewers says, I'm watching 10 monarch caterpillars Here. on my milkweed in the UP. Will these butterflies be the ones that make oh, their way? Oh, we've got one question coming in, so. Uh, Can you hear me, Charlie? At, the question is a person from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan wondering if uh, monarch butterflies right now that they're seeing could be the generation that would fly to Mexico. Um, it's possible. Uh, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, if we if we take a look at the uh, map here, we'll go back. Uh, it's oh, I'll go further to the other map. Yeah, so if we're looking here, Upper Peninsula of Michigan is really in generations three and four. And even where I am in the Adirondacks, I'm right on the cusp of three to four to four to five. So really when we look at more the end of August uh, is going to be uh, when, when we might start seeing generations four and five. And this, this graphic is a little bit deceiving because you might actually see generations one through five um, stay in the southernmost part of the United States or even in the middle. Um, so you'll see five generations in this whole wedge of blue, green, yellow, and orange. It's just that these orange ones are going to be the first ones to get those environmental cues of sun um, and chemicals that are telling them, oh, we need to go into our diurnal, uh, met, you know, uh, diapause. Uh, our, our reproductive diapause to be able to start making that migration south. So they'll be the first to be triggered because of the amount of daylight in, and then the next ones to be triggered will be in the yellow area, then the next ones in the green. Uh, so it's a little bit of a confusing topic to, uh, to wrap your head around, but um, 
very exciting. Charlie, Sunny, can you hear are, me? Are you there? Do you have any questions coming through on your end? Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Charlie? All right, without, without any other questions, I'm just going to uh, go down and share that I'll be presenting again uh, another behind the camera series. And the next one is going to be covering northern peatlands. And we'll be doing that on August 17th, same time. And uh, uh, that, that will actually be taking a look at drone photography that I've been doing uh, to be able to promote the conservation of this incredible ecosystem. And, um, you know, peatlands are areas that uh, are storing just unbelievable amounts of carbon. And so it's an area that we're really studying heavily. And where I'm located in the Adirondacks is the southernmost uh, extent of where those peatlands occur. And so some of the issues that we're facing are that as our climate warms and we have longer, drier summers, uh, less harsh winters, we're actually seeing that these, these areas where the peatlands in this area are starting to see some signs of stress. Um, so we're studying those areas heavily to know what the changes might be and what's going to happen to the wildlife that rely on those areas um, and kind of project out the future of peatlands in this area. But uh, it's kind of two parts, one part focusing on that conservation of this area and then the other part focusing on uh, photography. So thank you all so much for joining me today. I really appreciate your time and uh, thank you for your questions and I look forward to uh, hopping on on August 17th. Like I said, if you have a question about this, please shoot me an email, uh, send me a message. I'd love to hear from you. So thanks for your time and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye.